Sweet. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Intermarine Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I'm excited to say that we have a guest on today, Tom Walsh. I will let him do his own little introduction, but he is essentially, from my understanding, a con content creator, uh, CEO, founder of his own uh, chocolate energy company called Saver, which I am a huge fan of. I have bought some, so I'll keep a link in the description to plug that um, in case you're interested. But yeah, basically just going to hear about Tom's story, have a little bit of a conversation here today, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So I'll let Tom do his own little introduction here. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate, I like that intro. I appreciate that. Um, also just excited to be on here. Uh, before I even started creating content, I actually came across your page. You're like one of the first TikTok creators I ever saw when I downloaded the app. So I've been a fan since the beginning. So it's great to be on here. Um, kind of cool, you know, seeing things come full circle. Uh, but yeah, I think you kind of nailed it all. Uh, I kind of do two things. I have my uh, content creation through Stealth Health, which is basically just macro friendly, high protein recipes. And, you know, you know all about them on TikTok and on Instagram. I'm kind of that, share that lifestyle of like healthier, lower calorie, macro friendly eating and kind of how you can have a more balanced approach to dieting. Um, and then the second hat I wear is also Saver, of course. Um, my company, chocolate based energy drink, uh, kind of designed to be a coffee alternative kind of capture the experience of coffee, something indulgent that you can have every single morning, makes you feel good um, and kind of get that energy kick through something that tastes a little bit better than the typical energy drink, healthier um, and kind of aligns with everything I do on my page. So the two, two things I do kind of like really um, kind of share the same purpose of, you know, enjoy what you eat, have things that are indulgent, but also are good for you, make you feel good about yourself and they kind of tie together and kind of lead to the same purpose. So that's, that's what I do. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that message. And I've gotten in actually before I started creating content, I got into, I've always been into health and nutrition and I got into like sort of the anabolic type diet, like lower calorie, higher protein, like things that you enjoy eating, but are a little bit made a little bit healthier. So you can kind of eat things you actually enjoy. And that's what your account is all about. So I love coming across channels like that. And I think yours is even, yours is a little bit more of like, I don't, I don't know, gourmet, if that's the word, but it's, yeah. it's like recipes that taste really, really good. And you kind of like find that little, very small balance or niche between like, it actually tastes amazing. It's not like, you know, 70% is good. It's like basically as good, but then just a few simple swaps and, and it's that much healthier for you. Yeah. So you're able to yeah. kind of include everything. I appreciate that. I like the, the gourmet. Uh, I think that's, kind of what I, where I saw an opportunity and like the difference, the way I approached it. I really love all the anabolic stuff. I think um, there's obviously a bunch of amazing content creators there. Um, but where I kind of saw, you know, what was missing was people making recipes that genuinely did not feel like you're eating higher protein, lower calorie. Cause a lot of it was really focused on kind of like the bodybuilding community, the fitness community. And obviously I was in that, like, that's what got me into the high protein, low calorie approach was bodybuilding. Um, but I, my first passion was food. Um, I grew up in a family where like food was what ever, like that was everything we did. It was all centered around food. That's where I developed my greatest relationships um, and really just found a lot of purpose in life. And so where I felt like there was a big gap was like, nobody was making recipes that were focused on the food first on the taste first. And then it's almost secondary that it's healthy. And that's kind of like where the name came from stealth health, where it's like, it's almost like you don't notice that it's healthy for you. You could have, you could give this to people and they would just think it's a normal, you know, great meal that they're having. They'd have no idea. And, I do that all the time where I'll just like make things and not tell anybody that it's made healthier and try to like see if people notice. And um, yeah, that's kind of like the, the little bit of different approach that I take is like the food taste first, nutrition kind of second, almost, yeah. almost behind yeah. the scenes. That, yeah. That's awesome. That, that name makes a lot of sense now because I never knew exactly what that meant, but I feel like it's, it's perfectly <laughs> fit in. Like what made you come up with that name? Was it just like a random day? You just thought that that fits things perfectly i'd actually i'd actually heard it before like there's this idea of stealth health i think it was like it's kind of like an old i actually i don't know exactly where i heard it but it was kind of like this old concept i think they used and like i don't know like it, it was like a tool that like parents would use to help like sneak in like vegetables and the recipes for their kids type of thing they called it stealth health so it, it had been this coined term like a long time ago and i just heard it one day and i was like i kind of like that word um and like with naming anything, it was the same thing with Saver. It's it's such a black hole. Like you could name 
it's so easy to just get stuck in that trap of like, what am I going to name this? I've like, you can name it anything. And the really what it came down to is like, you know, I heard it, it was like, that sounds nice. Um, and really you give meaning to a name over time through your content that you create. And I was like, I'm just going to roll with that. It's good enough. And then eventually it becomes something once you um, kind of build your brand and, you know, kind of tie it to the name. So yeah, that's where it all certainly. started. Yeah, I feel like the process of naming things like this isn't necessarily something I was going to touch on today, but like it can be it's like simultaneously so important, but like not that important. And it's so difficult to do, but then it's such a basic thing. Like it, it's like it matters because it's the first thing people see and kind of the equatable thing they tie to it. But at the same time, like it's almost like I think of it like an iceberg, like everything you do to build around it and everything you do with that name is like underneath the water. And then the name is just the peak that people see, but it doesn't necessarily unless I feel like a really bad name can turn people off, but anything that's like kind of re like typical or, or not too out there that's like triggering to anyone, it will be fine as long as everything underneath is, is good and people align with what's going on with it. Exactly. Well, I mean, almost, and even triggering names can sometimes be good. So it's like, a, <laughs> it's a really, it really is a black hole. But yeah, the concept I learned from the beginning was like any name that is not obviously a bad name, is, is a good name because it's yeah. you eventually make it mean something that's why like you could make up a word and that's that's a fine name as long as yeah. you put meaning behind it eventually it doesn't it yeah. really doesn't matter you know yeah. but it's easy to for get sure. trapped in that hole <laughs> yeah for sure yeah so i i wanted to hear a little bit before like before you started creating content i think i've seen that you were in investment banking or or some type of role like that and then even before like what sort of led you to get into i banking like in terms of your childhood and then college and then getting into that and then that sort of shift away from that because you're you're out of that now right you've totally quit out of fully it, yeah. yeah 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 well I guess it's a little bit of a convoluted story um so I guess I'll, I'll start I'll just go through like the whole thing so first of all obviously I've already with my account and everything kind of the backstory was which was grew up love food and went to college um kind of with that backing of like food was a huge part of my identity got really into bodybuilding and kind of started feeling very restricted in my diet, kind of gave up all those things that I'd grown up loving and appreciating through life. Um, and so that's what kind of got me into cooking and learning the flexible dieting approach and all that. So that was kind of like my hobby, my passion through all of college, making these macro friendly meals, but it was just never something that like I thought to actually post on social media. And so I was like, and I, and I was really passionate about nutrition specifically above fitness, but I just didn't see a career path for it. It wasn't something that like, I could see myself making a career out of it all because I, I, it just to me it was like maybe I could be like a trainer and nutritionist like I, I just I didn't like I didn't have like the concept of creating content or maybe even starting a product company at the time so it was just this I, I didn't see opportunity there um, I was an economics major um, and I was always kind of like thought of myself as a numbers person like good at math and stuff like that so I was like what's what's the hardest thing I can do that would, is going to push me the most to like you know care about school and actually try and, and um and so to me, I was, I came across, I met somebody very early on in college that kind of was a little bit of a mentor to me. And he kind of, he was doing investment banking. He's just like, this is, you know, this is what's going to give you the greatest opportunity. Um, so it, he just influenced me very early on. So I set that as my goal at the very beginning of college, which was like, I'm doing investment banking. This is going to be my life. Um, and really from the beginning, I kind of recognized it as a thing that was going to be very difficult, was very out of my comfort zone. The people I saw that were in investment banking were very, um, you know, were people that were, I saw as very successful, confident, um, you know, people that I wanted to be and that I wasn't necessarily, I didn't think at that point in time that I was, um, you know, that's maybe like at their level. And I was like, and I recognized that in the pursuit of that, it would force me to level up and become somebody that I wasn't um, previously in my life. So it was just this goal I set in college. And um, obviously, so it was kind of like my entire focus ended up, you know, doing the internship and got the full-time offer. And right after that, so I had one more semester left of school um, and I, I did a five-year program. So I did, I got my master's in finance, uh, kind of like a four plus one type program. And so I got the full-time offer and I kind of came to the realization at that point, which was, you know, my goal, I, I wasn't actually interested in doing the job itself. My whole goal was basically oriented around getting the job. And so once I had done the internship and kind of proved myself and gotten the job, I was like, well, I don't actually want to do this. Like this job is not enjoyable to me. It doesn't really suit me and who I am. Um, and I kind of achieved it. So I, just, 
I felt good for like a week. I was like, Oh, I got the job. I did it. I achieved my big goal. And then all of a sudden I was just like, what do I do now? Like now I, now I like finished my last year of school and I'm going to go actually do this job for years and kind of grind away. Um, and so it was during that last year, I was like really just, you know, pursuing my, like really just digging into my hobbies, my passions for cooking and had the idea for Saver in my very last semester. And, you know, with that context, I was just very, I was, I guess I was just like primed for um, something to put all my energy into. So it came at the perfect time where I had spent all of college having this big goal I was working towards. And all of a sudden, you know, I had, you know, kind of nothing. And then I had, then I had this idea that really, really energized me. And I was just like, you know what, like, I know I have this job lined up and this, this like, this is a beverage idea. Like, I don't know anything about the beverage industry. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't even know how to start it, but I know that it energizes me. I know that it excites me. And I know that by like really just digging into this, like I'm going to learn so much and I'm going to be doing something that just, you know, at the very least, um, I enjoy doing. And so I kind of started working on the product. And by the end of that last semester, I was kind of like, okay, like I know I'm going to do this. I just am not at the point where I could realistically, you know, financially and personally where I could just quit, like, you know, cancel my job and like go all in on this beverage business. So I was like, I'm just going to keep working on this in the background and, you know, save some money. And then eventually once the product's kind of at a good point and I have enough kind of like financial backing and really also when I had the, once I, I felt like I needed to build the confidence to make that leap. So it was just such a undefined um, world to jump into. Um, and so spent, did two full years of investment banking, working on the product in the background. And this past June hit my two year mark and was at the point where I was ready to go all in on, all in on it. Had started my, had started Stealth Health account back in May, like two months earlier. It had just started getting traction. So it was kind of like everything just started coming together um, right at the end, um, quit the job and then just went all in on it. And uh, since then, you know, like my account's grown a ton. It's been amazing. Save, we launched Saver two months ago now and it's kind of all just come together so nicely. And it was, you know, such a long buildup that like it, it, was, it was really scary to make that jump. But um, now that I'm here, like everything feels right. I'm very, very glad the way that I did things. I still got that banking experience, you know, saved enough money to like kind of be able to take this leap. Um, and now, yeah, so that, that's what kind of brought me to here. So a little yeah. long-winded, but <laughs> no, that was, that was perfect. I'd love to hear stories like that. And it's really cool. And I resonate <clears throat> with that in, a lot because I do both right now. Like I still have a full-time job. It's not iBanking. So my hours are not quite that. It's probably not that much of a chunk of my life, especially now my job has been relatively light. Like I am technically in a work day today and I'm taking an hour to do a podcast episode yeah. in the middle of it because we're still remote. So I've been able to balance it, but there's definitely, you know, part of me that's kind of freaked out by the idea of not having that security, but at the same time, I'm able to do both. It's, I am passionate about creating content and making videos. So I make time for it, no matter what, it's never felt like work at all. So right now in my life, I feel like I'm okay doing that. And I don't necessarily, I do have things that I make money from content wise. And I think if I went all in, I would be able to make more from it. I'm sure, especially, you know, if I start doing one-on-ones or something like that, but yeah, yeah I, I resonate with that a lot. And then something else, I mean, we've actually DM'd about the idea of, of goals and, and having these things that you're working towards. And I feel like you with the iBanking is just like a perfect situation of that, like explained very well. And it's, it's that you had this goal this whole time of, of getting this iBanking job. And it wasn't even the act of doing it as being fulfilling in itself. It was just that goal in the future that you were working towards and, you know, you achieved it and it was great for a week. And then it was like, holy shit, now I actually have to do it. And like the doing in itself isn't necessarily fulfilling. So I think it's just so important to recognize that goals are fleeting. Like the achievement of them is a moment in time. It's not necessarily if you're always working towards a goal, thinking that is going to bring you fulfillment, it's like, it's all backwards. The fulfillment comes from what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finding, you know, the content creation and the creation of Saber like that, fulfilling yourself in itself, like that is sort of the, the pinnacle, I don't know, the ideal sort of situation as, as difficult as it can be for people to 
recognize that. I feel like most people who have sort of had this goal and then achieved it and then realized that isn't what brought them the fulfillment is able to understand that. And it's just whether or not you understand that to the point that it influences you enough to make a change or you realize it early enough. And I think it's really cool that you were able to realize that when you did and, and make, make moves with it. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's something I think about all the time. Like I was, I was very lucky to have had that experience as early as I did. Cause I feel like there's so many people that could work their entire career. Like maybe it takes them 15 or 20 years to hit that point of, you know, I don't know what their goal would necessarily be, but maybe they don't hit that goal till they're 40 years old. And then they have the same exact realization I have. And it's not like your life's over when you're 40 years old, but it's like, you would have much rather come to that realization in your early twenties when you still kind of have this huge, you have a lot, it's a lot easier to make a huge career change, you know, have kids and a family um, and things kind of tiny you down. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it's a great realization to come to early. And it was something, you know, I'd like heard so much throughout, like, throughout my life and people hear all the time, but you really kind of have to have the experience yourself and to feel it, to actually understand. And yeah, I mean, the goal really is to like find the thing that, you know, the dream is to, to like be doing something that brings you that energy in the moment while you're building it with Saver specifically. That was what I realized at the very, very beginning, which was like, I've already, like, like, I already feel like I achieved the goal. There's no end goal here. Like there's nothing I'm literally working towards. I already have it. You know, I've had it this entire time. And I think about that all the time too, now with stealth health as well, which is like, there's no end goal, like at all. Like I don't, there's nothing I'm building towards. Like I'm not gonna like, like sell it or anything. there's no like real big thing. Um, you know, I don't have like a follower goal. It's just, I'm already living it and there's nowhere. And, and that's exactly where I need to be. And there's something kind of beautiful about that. Um, and that's really, really all you need. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I think sure you feel I'm, the same with you. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was like, for whatever reason, like what started me with content was I imagine just being old. I kind of had these scenarios I would go through in the morning, like imagining being old. And I posted videos about this and, and thinking about what I regret about my life. And, and it wasn't even, I wasn't even creating content. I didn't have friends that were in the content creation space. And for whatever reason, like not creating more content kept coming up. And I had friends who knew I had, you know, a bunch of interests. I've always been very interested in health and fitness, you know, mindfulness, mindset, consciousness, all of that stuff. And, and they were like, why don't you, you know, become an influencer? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like maybe one day we'll see, probably not. And then it just kept coming up every single morning for like a year and a half. And I finally pulled the trigger on it and, and started. So that for me was kind of the idea in the sense of, of having fulfillment in itself, it was just, now I know that's, I'm not going to regret it anymore because I've done it. And I never had any goals of anything like happening with it, like creating a podcast or doing any, like getting any followers whatsoever. It was just once I started posting it and I started with a day in the life YouTube video that got like a couple hundred views and then like mostly Instagram story stuff, just literally turning the camera around and like film it. I was actually one of the first things I started doing was making anabolic recipes on my Instagram story. Oh, really? They're still, <laughs> they're still in my story highlights from it's like last August of 2020, just like, you know, anabolic Greg Doucette's anabolic French toast, like uh high protein ice cream, stuff like that. And that was sort of the beginning. And then I just took part of that YouTube vlog and it was the intro and I threw it on TikTok. I was like, I have no idea anything about TikTok. And I had an account. I was like, see how this does. And it went viral. And I was like, all right, now I have a couple thousand followers and you got that just, first taste. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, I had no idea what was going on, but um, it was cool. So it's kind of like similar to, to what you're doing. I don't necessarily have any goals with any of this. I'm just enjoying the doing I do, you know, videos and do podcasts and just like the act in itself is enough. And, and I think the other thing I wanted to bring up was with you doing the investment banking for two years and kind of doing saver in the background, I feel like people have this misconception with, or I don't know about misconception, but just a lot of people talk about like, do what you love, like quit your job right now. Like, fuck everything, just do what you want and things will happen. And I think usually when people ask me that, I'm like, figure out 
the balance that works for you. Like if you care yeah. enough about something, you will find the time in your free time to work on it. Cause I think a lot of people fall into situations where they think they love something, but they actually just hate what they're doing. So they quit that. They think they love it. They don't actually love it. And then they're kind of like in no man's land. So I think being able to balance sort of something that maybe you don't love, but it allows you to work on the other thing without making money from it in your off time. So how was that for you with balancing? Because I know iBanking can be insane hours. So was that, you know, kind of tough to do? Or was it that you loved it so much that it was no issue ever? I mean, yeah, it was it was very, very difficult. Um, I would actually honestly like I did. So I did those first three months before um, I started in investment banking. I did a ton of like the upfront work, research and product development. And when I started, I mean, when I started in banking, it was like so all consuming that honestly, I'd say probably the first you know, four to six months, like I was still having save. Like I still had, like I had the product myself and I would have it, have it every morning, but it was basically impossible for me to actually work on the product. And I actually kind of got sucked into like the whole, I um, mean, like everybody in investment banking kind of goes down. Like the, there's like this kind of path that everybody does. Like you do investment banking, then you go to, for two years and you do private equity and then you go to business school. And like, I got sucked into it a little bit where like, right when I started, everyone around me was doing it. I'm like, okay, I have this crazy idea that like, I'm really passionate about, but I just don't know what's going to happen. And I got sucked into the whole private equity recruiting game for a little bit. I went, I only went through two or three processes. And after going through those in the first couple of months, I was just like, okay, like, I do not want to do this. Like, I know that Sabre Oh, it was almost like a, oh, unfortunately, like I know I need to do saver type of things. It re really scared me to like, to make that jump and to come to that realization of, I'm not going to go down this traditional path that everyone else is going down. I'm going to, and I, I have to follow this. I almost feel like I didn't have a choice. Um, but I, it was very hard at the beginning. And I will say a huge part of what made it possible though, was quarantine starting. And so like, I, cause typically like not to say, like, I hate to say that there's a silver lining to it, but you know, for some people there was, and there was. You know, so I was in the office for about seven months. And at that time it was impossible. You know, like I couldn't work on anything there. I mean, like there's just always eyes on you. Um, and then quarantine started and I was working from home. And um, so my, I actually have a co-founder with Saver. We were actually living together at the time. And so we had, I had, we kind of started working on it together for about two months before quarantine started. And then all of a sudden, you know, I just like had all these pockets of hours throughout the day, kind of, I mean, just like you're having now, which is like, you know, I could, you know, for two or three hours in the afternoon, devote all my time when like nobody was like bothering me and messaging me, I could like work on Saver on the side and it made it possible. I mean, honestly, if, if that wasn't the case, like I probably honestly wouldn't be here right now. It probably would have taken a lot longer. And, but yeah, I, I mean, it was easy from the perspective of giving up other things in my life. Like there was nothing else I would rather be doing after like I would finish my banking work on the weekend and I wanted to work on Saver. So it's like, I, this is what, where I want to take my life. And this is the direction I want to go. And so it was just, it was way more important than anything else. So it was almost like a, a matter of priority, which um, if you really want to do it, you're going to make time for it. And, and like you were saying, it, like basically any job you're working, if, if, if there's something that's pulling you, like you have that you can create the time um, to devote to something that you're truly passionate about. Like it, there's so much time in the day and on the weekends. Um, and I, I do think that you should, <laughs> you definitely should not quit your job um, before you need to. And if I wasn't doing banking, like working an extremely time intensive job, I probably would have stayed in it a little bit longer. Honestly, I'm just like, keep that, you know, safety net of you know, having a salary really. Um, and I think you should take it as far as you possibly can before you just quit everything and go all in. Um, I think that's definitely the best route. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool to hear how, because with quarantine, it, that was what did it for me too. Like if I was still going into the office and I, I just wouldn't have also like a lot of people during quarantine like blew up on social media especially yeah. like in the fitness industry there's so many people that I started following that just exploded because it was such a a need for people to figure that out to do you know something so just seeing some of those even like that was where I started when I started creating content I didn't know what route I was going to take. And I still don't necessarily, obviously my TikTok is niched down a bit, but I still incorporate like all aspects of my life. And I post like 
on YouTube, I'll post like recipes just real quick that I'm making. Like when I do a day in life log, like I'll show what I'm eating or I'll show workouts and things like that. And, and so it's interesting with quarantine to hear, because I think it's true for so many people, like there wouldn't yeah. be probably nearly as many content creators. I don't know if TikTok oh, yeah. would be what it is now without quarantine. So, you know, as difficult of a time it was for the world, there are, I mean, there's silver linings to everything. And for me, 2020, as you know, as tough it as it was and with lockdowns and stuff, like it was probably one of the most life-changing years of my life, like in a in yeah. a positive way. Um Same. yeah. 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 But I'm I'm also curious with your on the so on the content creation side, what drove you to start with that and how was that process just of like starting and I know a lot of people like I feel like pretty much anyone could do pretty well on content if they like everyone has something unique about themselves unique yeah. interests but you know usually it's like fear of judgment um from people that they know that's why they don't mm -hmm. do it like even for myself when I first started TikTok I used the I, my name was Randy Dufresne. To, so people didn't know that it was <laughs> oh, no my way. account. And I had that for like a month. And then I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, this That's is hilarious. like, I have a few followers. So like, I should change my name because long term, like, I want my name to be my brand. <laughs> people um, are going to be confused. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm curious about you getting into that. Like, when you realized you wanted to start doing it, like how that process was getting into it. Yeah. Well, that's also really funny. Cause like I, and I'll get to that. I had the exact same experience. Like I like did not want anybody in my life to know about it when I first started. Um, but yeah, I, it's actually kind of funny. So like I, we had done, we did like this beta selling period with Saber last spring. So we were still working our jobs. We were kind of like in like, kind of like secretly selling almost. Cause like we couldn't, if our jobs found out we were doing this, like we would have gotten fired. So we were selling to our college town and kind of playing around with social media. And I think, so we would, we were trying to like learn social media. I'd never used my Instagram or anything like at all my whole life. Like I'd made like five posts my whole life. Um, and so through that experience with Saver, trying to figure out, you know, how to like be a brand on social media was very difficult for us. Cause we, we wanted to take a very genuine approach and be human behind the account. And we found it just very hard to like connect with people, um, to reach out to, like people to try the product and just like connect with our consumers as a brand. Cause like when you're like, you know, our, our Instagram's like drink saver, like you reach out to people like, Oh, why is this like drink product trying to talk to me? And it's very hard to like just form relationships that way. And so we did that for a couple months at the very end. Um, I kind of came to the realization of like, okay, well maybe instead of trying to just directly build a brand through this account, like I, this is an opportunity for me to like start doing something that I've been passionate about for a long time and you know connect with people in a real way by making my own content that'll also connect to the saber brand as well and also like a big part of it was just um you know i probably could have started creating content years and years earlier but building the confidence to you know start a company and to launch saber to quit my job and go all in on this thing building that confidence you know kind of took away all the excuses i had previously told myself that stopped me from creating content it was like you know, if I'm ever going to do this right now, it's the time to just go all in on, on myself. And yeah, so I was terrified of what people were going to think, especially the people that knew me. And like, I had literally, like I started it in May and I did not tell anybody in my life. Like, I, I think I had, like, I'd grown my TikTok, you know, a decent amount. Like I had like you know, six or 7,000 followers on Instagram and like my family didn't even know, like literally no one in my life knew. And it was probably like two and a half months in and then I like finally told them and and like after telling people, like, and, and I still like delayed telling even like my good friends, like I, it took me a long time. Like I almost was like one by one, like I kind of let people in because it was just very unnatural to me to like how all these people, you know, seeing my thoughts and my content and like judging it every single day. Um, and so, but like every new person I would tell, like they start following me for like a couple of days, it would like be in my head, like, okay, they're watching. And, but then it just kind of, I would just kind of forget and I would just, just go back to operating naturally. Um, but that was a huge that's probably the huge, like the biggest benefit I've gained from creating content was just like realizing that it doesn't matter and that, you know, everybody's judging you anyways. Like you're always being judged. That's just like a part of the human experience and being like that fear of being negatively judged. Like it makes no sense. Cause like 
almost like being negatively judged by people is almost a good thing. Cause if you're like truly expressing yourself, cause when you start, if you get negatively judged by somebody for tr truly expressing yourself, those people are just going to be out of your life and the wrong people aren't going to ever enter your life in the future. Um, and if you're like kind of putting on some sort of facade and trying to like fit in, um, you're going to keep bringing in the wrong people. And, but once I started creating content, expressing myself, just like putting my thoughts out there that even when I felt comfortable, more and more people started coming into my life that I aligned with and started having real, more and more real conversations, relationships and less and less fake ones. And that was like a huge, um, you know, part of the growth of starting to create content and something that, you know, I didn't realize would be an, like an effect, um, but I'm very glad to have experienced. And it sounds like you had a very, very similar experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. No, I, I resonate with like so many of the things that you're saying. It's pretty funny, but I think that whole process of, you know, being yourself, and this is something I talk about too, like it doesn't make any sense not to, like there's no upside whatsoever. It's just going to lead to more anxiety and depression. And it kind of like that whole process, like you were saying, naturally weeds people out. And it's like, yeah. why would you want people in there who don't, you know, resonate or vibe with who you truly are. Cause if you're not being yourself, you're either like, people are going to like you for who you're not. And you're going to yeah. attract sort of like the people that don't actually like you for you. So either you keep acting like that and you keep those people around, but you're not actually necessarily enjoying your time with them, or you stop doing that. Those people fall away and other people come in and everything is just easier. It's kind of like, you know, paddling up the river versus allowing the river to just carry you and, and everyone too, like every single person you've ever interacted with, even people who see us through TikTok, just like one video pop up, like they have a perception of us and yeah. every single person that anyone interacts with has a perception of them. So there is it's thousands of versions of you, tens of thousands, millions of versions of you inside the heads of all the people you've interacted with. So how are you going to like allow those people to like, like you, if, how can you be thousands of versions of yourself? You can't. So like, you might as well just be the one that allows you to be happy and the only, like, uh, help the only perception that matters which is your own because there's so many exactly. out there so i think that whole learning experience creating content kind of accelerates that period very quickly because you know i feel like both of us don't i, I get a little controversial with certain things sometimes but for the most part especially your account like you're posting recipes to help people like live a yeah. healthy life. And I still see like trolls coming on your account oh, yeah. and like posting stuff. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, I feel like my friends tell me that it's crazy that I get negative comments on mine. And, I, and then seeing yours, like, I feel like yours is even less controversial with anything it's just like recipes it's and food yeah, I, yeah <laughs> people are passionate like, about food though I mean, they are and, and <laughs> i've uh, learned yeah i see i see your responses and you're always like handle it so well and there are times where i'm in a state where i'm like handling it well whatever and then there's times where i like dig in a little bit and say something sarcastic just to like play around but yeah it, it's it's interesting seeing that is that something that was tough to handle at first and you've kind of learned about and better to handle, or have you always just been like, you know, it's their perception. It has nothing to do with me, whatever. You know, I guess a little bit of both. Like, yeah, I, at first it was never, it never like really negatively affected me to receive hate because it was just like, it just, again, it was food. So it's not like they, they weren't really like able to personally attack me and my character, which, you know, my, <laughs> I have been attacked. There was a couple of posts I made where I had some like huge outrage about, um, but yeah, I actually, I think dealing with that and receiving a lot of hate has actually helped so much with like learning to deal with judgment. Cause like, like there's one specific recipe. I don't know if you were remember this, but I had like a bagel post I put up and it caused like this massive outrage on, I don't want to go too deep in it, but it caused a lot of outrage on social media for whatever reason. And that like it really negatively affected me for a couple of days because I was like, oh my gosh, like I felt like I totally messed up because I was getting some like serious like character attacks thrown at me. And then, you know, having experienced that, I was just like, 
this like doesn't matter at all. Like this is it just after having been through that and had hundreds of people attack me, I was like, I'm I'm fine, I'm safe. Like that didn't actually negatively affect me. And also it was mostly a reflection of how unhappy these people are um, just being thrown at me. And after that experience, which was the summer, I like it never has bothered me again to like receive any kind of hate because I just know it's gonna come, especially when I'm like when I make anything cultural. Um with food, like, you know, people are like, you know, it's, there's deep roots um, in food, especially with culture. Um, and so I know that like, if I make something and I put like Italian, even though like I am Italian, if I make something that's Italian, like I'm gonna get a bunch of Italians that are very angry about me calling it Italian because it's not the way they make it. And so that type of thing happens all the time, but it's like, you just kind of get accustomed to it. And, um, but I, I could, it's one of those, it, it definitely, I remember like thinking about it at the time and like, it kind of made me sad to think how many people if they were receiving this type of feedback for creating content would give up because, you know, a lot of people just wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, I was just lucky I was in, you know, a good mind state to handle that hate being thrown at me. But a lot of people I could see just like receiving that and just quit it because it, it is, um, it's crazy the amount of just like people just come at you for anything um, on social media, especially TikTok. But yeah, um, but yeah. yeah it, it definitely <laughs> builds some thick skin for sure, especially like, yeah, it's, it's, I guess thinking about how, how much of a passion food is for people, I guess it, it kind of makes sense in that way, especially going down the cultural route for sure. But yeah, I mean, I see that when, you know, I make posts about, you know, religion and stuff like that. And people, you know, that is their identity, similar to how food people identify with food, like people very much identify with certain things. And the stronger the identification, the stronger the outrage is going to be, which I find. And, and it's, I think it's important to remember that it doesn't reflect on you. It's just them reflecting their own inner state. Like I've posted videos about receiving hate and just, you just take the time to think about, you know, happy people who are passionate and successful and doing things like they don't spend their days commenting hateful stuff on people's videos. So exactly. really at the end of the day, like all you can do is feel empathy for these people and not, not pity that you're like better than them and their life's so sad that they do this, but genuine empathy because they clearly, all I see now when I see hateful comments coming at my character is, is just I'm unhappy, just translated into yes. different words, essentially. So it's not even like I get very mad. And there, that's not to say I don't still like I'll read stuff. I'm like, like I block people here and there, especially when they consistently are just nitpicking at things that don't actually have to do with it, or just like straight up not even talking about the video and coming at my character or whatever. I'm just like, yeah. I don't need like it's it's a privilege for you to be able to comment on someone else's stuff. And, and I actually think it would be cool, which I'm sure will never happen if TikTok or any social media, you had to verify your profile in order to comment on people's things, like yeah. have a picture of your face with your actual name on it. And I think that would deter from a ton that would. of hey, Cause you never see like a verified account talking shit about someone's stuff. So I think that would be a, interesting upgrade for sure but i think yeah just doing content it's it's crazy how no matter what you talk about people will come at you so you just have to focus on the good and remember all of the people that you're helping for the most part and then the other stuff just you you kind of forget about it naturally eventually yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah yeah so uh with uh so we got into the content side. So with Saver, was that, when did you, I guess, with iBanking, like, when did you know, like, for sure that you were going to quit after two years? Was that like leading up to, was it kind of like one week you were just like, it's time? Or was it, you knew for a while that it was like at the two mark, I'm done. You put in your, you know, two weeks, you let them know you kind of had an offboarding process or whatever. Yeah. So it's hard to say when I knew, when I, I knew I wanted to, I like, I knew I wanted to the week that I had the idea. Like, it was like, I, I remember I, I have a note in my phone from when I wrote down, I was like, I knew that the way I felt about it just felt so right. Um, the, the energy I felt felt so different than the energy I felt towards banking, even from the beginning. I knew it was what I wanted to do. 
but it took a long time to get to the point that I knew it was what I was going to do, if that makes sense. So I guess, yeah, I knew I wanted to do it from the very beginning, but I guess to get to the point of like, I'm for sure quitting at the two year mark. I mean, honestly, it's hard to really say. I actually, because for a long time I was considering quitting before I got to the two year mark. And that would have been the irresponsible move um, because like, like half of our compensations at the end of the year, I was like really, like really wanting just to leave because I you know, like really dislike the job. And I kind of had to like constantly reflect and remind myself, like, I, I want to leave right now, not because I'm so passionate and so like excited to start this, but because like, I just hate this job right now. Like I know I'm passionate and I know I'm going to get to it, um, but I need to kind of stick through. So, I mean, honestly, I knew the whole time it just, it just took, um, I mean, I guess it just was kind of like a natural buildup. And by the time I got to the end of the two year mark, the work had been done that it was, uh, it made sense. And I knew I wasn't going to stay on for my third year. Um, but yeah, I guess like from the beginning, it was just a matter of like building, um, getting the product to a place where I was ready to take the leap. And then it made sense. Yeah. So Yeah. That's, that's kind of the realization I came to recently, just like very similar. Like we get our, like I work in digital advertising. So our bonus is not similar to like iBanking. It's not like, you know, full salary or anything close to that. It's like a percentage of it, but we get that in March. So a few months ago, I was like, I want out. I, but I don't even, it's not even that I hated my job. I'm just like, I want to do this all the time. And I yeah. really like, this is my passion. I know I like this way more than my job. And then kind of thought about it and I'm like, you know, it's not super busy. I'm able to do both. I get my bonus in end of March. So about a month ago, I was like, I'm just going to stick it out through end of March, keep doing both, see where I'm at end of March and kind of just like reevaluate things. So it was kind of like freeing to make that decision to just, I know I'm sticking with it through the next few months. Like I'm able to do both. I can still work my job, but I'm not the interesting thing is like, I'm not, and I've already talked to my boss about this, like pushing for promotion. So that's, that's a big reason why people stay very busy. And that's why hours get long in, in my job, because people are always striving for the next role. And like, you know, it can happen every year or so. My company's relatively small, but for me, it was like, in order to make that push, I would have to do so much more work that even yeah. if I got you know, the promotion with the extra pay, my hourly rate would probably go down realistically. So exactly. I knew, I know I want to do both. Like I'm, I'm still making money every two weeks. So I, I've been able to sort of balance that, but very similar that it's just like, it, it wouldn't make sense given how much I can make until then, and then get my bonus and, and just to, to quit early, I guess. So I think, yeah, I think there's so many people out there who have this desire to, you know, quit their job and do something else. And I think it's just really important to figure out if that's actually your priority. Like, are you spending your afternoons after work? Are you getting up before work and working on it? Are you, you know, not going out with your friends every single Friday and Saturday so that you yeah. can allow yourself the time to work on it? Like if you're passionate enough about something, you will find the time you, there is time to do that. And I, I think, a lot of it too is just people getting caught up in in society and this this natural sort of function and the normalized function of working nine to five Monday through Friday, going to going out Friday, going out Saturday, like being hungover in the mornings, like not really being productive, and then having the Sunday scaries and then doing it all over again. Yeah, and it's like it's if you're back. just yeah, and part of that is because. I think it comes back to the fear of judgment or insecurity that they don't want to do something different than the crowd. And that's become the normalized behavior. So, you know, when all your friends are going out one night and you're like, no, I'm actually going to, you know, do this or just stay in so I can do this in the morning, or even just, even if you're not working on something, just to have that time for yourself to, to take a breath and like, look around and, and see things for what they are and, and take that time. So I think people get sort of sucked into that vortex. And like you were saying, it's nice to realize it when you're younger or realize if you have some sort of other passion that you're able to work on. But I think a lot of people don't. And that's sort of the whole idea of a midlife crisis is people realize it when they're, you know, 45, 50. And it's like, fuck, they're, they're not 25 years anymore, but they still, you know, wish they were. And so they try and make up for it 
And it's like, if they had, and it's still like, even if you realize it at 40, 45, you still have, you know, a lot of time to work on it. But at that point, most people are tied down to things. So I think yeah, just, yeah. yeah, just having that, I guess, I guess it's a confidence in yourself or just realization of how normalized certain things have gotten in society and realizing that, you know, your priority should be yourself, not, you know, submitting to what other people think of you or how they think you should live their, your life. And I think the whole idea of other people having any opinion whatsoever on what someone else is doing is just gets more and more absurd to me, like every single day that I think about it. And (laughs) and the less you're able to, you know, less emphasis you're able to put on other people's opinions, it just inevitably brings about more happiness into your life from what I have found for sure. 100%, 100%. But I also, I also really liked what you said about the, uh, like when you fall into that typical lifestyle, like going out every single weekend, kind of following what everybody's doing, like you lose something that I think a lot of people underrate is having that time, like not necessarily to be working on your side project or like being productive, but like to be doing nothing. Cause that was something that was so important for me. And actually something I struggled with for a long time. Cause I'm a person that I really like to sit and just think um, and spend time with my thoughts. Um, and that for a long time to me felt like really unproductive time. And I tried to like make it productive, but then over time I came to realize that that was actually the most valuable time I had during every single week. Cause that's where I was able to actually critically think about everything that I'm doing. And I think a lot of people are always trying to either you know, like be like going out doing things or trying to like force themselves to be productive. And if you miss out on that time where you're just allowing yourself to exist, observe what's going on around you and just like kind of sit with your thoughts. It's so much harder to like, um, to like find the right path for your life without that time. And I think that's something that a lot more people need in their life, honestly. Yeah, certainly. I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Watts or follow him. He's a British philosopher that he, he was, he didn't have necessarily religion, but he had a lot of Buddhist practices and he has a quote, when you're silent, it speaks, when you speak, it's silent. And I think that idea of taking the time to do nothing, sit with your thoughts and not judge yourself on top of that for not, you know, quote unquote, being productive. It allows for like a lot of the times when I have video ideas or certain things, it's from when I'm doing nothing, when I'm on a walk with no headphones in and just wandering around, like things will hit me because you allow that space. You kind of like are peeled back enough where you don't have all of this noise going on or all of these things that you're focused on and allow things to sort of come to you instead of trying to force things. And I think something for me, which sounds kind of similar to you is when more recently, I have become a lot less structured with things. I kind of allow things to, to flow as they are. I used to get up like really early work out first thing in the morning, like meditate, do all these things that I had to get done before like 8am or else I didn't feel good about myself. And I would like judge myself. And, and recently I've been more so just like whenever I get tired, I go to bed and then I make sure I sleep for like eight hours. And then whenever yeah. I, that time comes in the morning, I get up, I'll go for a walk and then like start work and then find some time during the day to work out or after work or whatever, and just be a lot less structured with things. And it was very difficult for me to do that at first because I would judge myself for not doing that and felt like I wasn't, you know, being that productivity. So it was pretty difficult. And it took me a few weeks where I felt like kind of bad about myself until I realized that that was more of the issue than the productivity side of it. And I was actually yeah. coming to more clear realizations through just allowing things to happen and sometimes being more structured if I felt like being more structured, but not having that internal judgment on top of it when I wasn't necessarily as structured. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally resonate with that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very, very, I think my best ideas, my best work are always done without structure. Um, like even, even with like recipes, like there was a long time where I would, try to, I'm like, okay, this week I'm going to make like these five recipes. And I would like, like look up ideas, think of ideas. And that was when it started to feel like a huge burden on my shoulder. Of like, I'm just going to force And If I didn't make those recipes, I failed. And like, now my approach is basically just like, I'm going to open my fridge, whatever comes to me. Like if I feel inspiration today to make a recipe, I'm going to make it. And that's my entire creation process now is just like, what comes to me, what excites me is what I make. And it's always better content. It's always better. I mean, whatever work it is, I think it applies to everything. When you let it come naturally, it's so much better versus forcing it. And I was 
And I always struggled with um, like trying to structure myself to be as productive as possible, like going down the banking route. Um, and that was like, I, I, I spent years in that mode of just like, I need to find ways to maximize productivity always like minimum, like be as efficient as possible and always had the negative, like the opposite effect that I desired. Um, like trying to be productive is always going to make you less productive because you're thinking about trying to be productive and it's not, you're not allowing things to come naturally. Um, but yeah, the, like the hard part of it is finding the balance of, you know, structure and lack of structure. Cause I've been on both ends. I've been on the extreme structure ends, seen how that got, how that goes. And I've also been on the extreme, like zero structure. And that can also <laughs> not work at times, especially like running a business, like there's places where I have to have structure. Otherwise, you know, th things will just like the business will die. And so there's you know, finding the balance is the hardest part. And um, it's especially difficult when you're you know, starting a business or doing something independent away from a job, finding that balance of structure and lack of structure. But that's like you only find it by, you know, experimenting over time and kind of seeing what works best for you. Yeah, certainly. I think it's so important to find that balance that works for you too and realizing that it, there's no correct balance like there's no right balance it, it, it is very very individualistic so not like to not take too much time to ever put too much pressure on yourself to have the balance that someone else has like some yeah. people being incredibly structured work some people being not structured at all works but i think most people fall somewhere in between and i think finding that balance is important and then throughout that process of finding that balance not judging yourself too much along the way and eventually things will kind of settle and the the chips will fall in the correct place because it is the place that works for you inherently. So I think, I think that's an awesome message to spread for sure. And yeah. we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here quick, but one more question I want to ask was with your, with your content, when you're creating it, what do you like, what setup do you use to have it? Cause like your loops are always awesome. Like it always sounds good. It always looks awesome. Like, do you use a editing app or do you use your phone or do you have a separate camera or what is that process? Like, yeah, I'm actually very glad you asked about this. Cause like people ask me this all the time and like assume like I have equipment, like I, I have the most jank setup ever. Like I literally have a, like, you know, those little like phone connectors, like FaceTime connector. It's basically like a little like malleable FaceTime phone holder thing. And so it's uh -huh. just like, I put my phone on that. Like, um, like this, like a sort of tripod type thing. It's, it's sort of, a, it's like a tripod, but it's like something you can just connect to any surface essentially. I, I guess I can okay. grab it, but um, it's just, I just got it off Amazon. It was like $10. I put my phone on that and I can kind of like set up any angle. I have a studio light that was like $50. And then I edit, yeah, I have an editing app on my phone that like was literally like the first, like I saw an ad on TikTok for it and downloaded it. So I literally, that's all I use. I use my phone, this phone holder, and I have one light. And that's, that's like all the equipment I have. I think people assume you need, like when I first started, I was like one month in, I was like, okay, when am I going to buy a camera? When am I going to get like the advanced editing software and all this stuff? And I was like, I like definitely don't need that. Nobody needs that. And especially with TikTok, um, like, and you can make very good, highly produced looking content, but you don't even need highly produced looking content on TikTok these days or Instagram. And so I think that, uh, yeah, in a very basic setup, very easy to work with. And I, but I, I've gone through that process so many times of like, oh, I need to get more equipment. I need to get the expensive, nice things. So it's like, you just, you don't need it. Like the, the more simple your setup can be, the better. Um, like there's no reason to complicate it to, because you think it's better. If what you have is working, like just, just keep rolling with it and keep it as simple as you possibly can. So that's, yeah, my setup's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's cool to hear. Cause yeah, yeah, I was always curious about that with your account, but yeah, I think people, that's another barrier for people is they think that they need all this equipment. And I've, I've come across people or, or heard of people who do like get a whole setup and then, and then start doing the content. And then they like it, the passion dies out or they feel like this need to use it because, and it's like, if you have an iPhone, like you can do any, especially now, like if you have like the 12 or the 13, like you have the 4k, yeah. like that's how I film all the YouTube videos I put out are all just on my iPhone and it's way simpler too. It allows for you to kind of like do things on the fly and not, and, exactly. and not have as much of a barrier. Like if, if you're a, you know, vlogger on YouTube with like millions of followers, then yeah, it might make sense if you want a clearer picture on your videos to get a camera. Cause you just are making so much money that you might as well just do it. 
great. But before then, like both of us have decent followings and I've never filmed a TikTok not on my iPhone and I've edited very few outside of TikTok. It's all yeah. like all the stuff is just on there. And it's more about, I think the, there are certain accounts that the uh, aesthetic of the video matter quite a bit, but I think for most of it, it's more about the content within it that matters a lot more and, and allow for more consistency with things as well. So it, you don't need, you know, the whole professional setup. If at some point down the road, you want to do it, but starting out, especially like you have an iPhone, you have enough to create a lot of content. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like the exact same content that we were talking about earlier with like, you don't need to quit your job and go all in the second you have an idea to like pursue what you want. Like you probably have everything you need and you're just you have to be able to like look and be like and listen to yourself and recognize you're just making a bunch of random excuses to like not start making the content when really you have your phone like your phone 100 like, i even think no matter the aesthetic you're going for you could do it on an iphone like you have like all my videos up to this point i had a 10 you know like i had a fine camera um like and that makes great looking content like you have what you need in your hands um it's just a matter of like starting to do it really um and not looking to other accounts to like not looking at other people and thinking you need to do exactly what they do. Cause I, you know, I was looking at other food creators, um, like especially the really, really big ones. And like, they're using really nice camera setups. They have full studios and all this stuff. So like, I just assumed, well, like to be them, I have to, to get what they have, but it's just, they're just doing things differently than the way I want to do things. And like, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever need that setup. Honestly, like what I have now is so easy and so simple. And like, why would I complicate it beyond what it is now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I think, yeah, I think down the road you want to get a studio great, but it's after you sort of build that passion for it. Cause I think if you do anything yeah. like that, it'll just breed burnout and a feelings yes. of that you need to do things. And it doesn't allow for as much flexibility. It can be financially like more difficult if, if you start out by investing a ton into it before you're getting anything out of it. Like it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it. You don't need it. And it's just, like you said, it's just another excuse that people make for not putting themselves out there and doing it. And I really do have a belief that everyone could be making content and expressing I themselves. Wish. And it's not that people don't have something to share. It's that there it's typically comes down to fear of judgment, fear of failure, feel like fear of what people are going to say about them. And at the end of the day, you're not going to please everyone. So might as well just please yourself. And it's, if it's something you really want to do, like, you know, you have a limited time here, so might as well do it. Right. Yeah. You know, I a hundred percent agree with that. I mean, and like now after having done this for a couple months, like everybody I talk to, I'm like, I'm like basically telling them like, start making content. Like there, you have a story to tell, you know, it's like, it's as simple as that. Um, maybe you just don't see it now, but everybody, like you have a unique story. People will be inspired by it if you start sharing it. Um, it doesn't need to be complicated. I think people just overcomplicate it so much from the very beginning, but yeah. it just doesn't need to be. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly with, with everything, people love to overcomplicate it. And at the end of the day, like that's, people do it because it's easier to make money when you complicate something and then tell someone that they have to follow you in order to make it less complicated or you have to buy this <laughs> yeah. to make it less complicated. And if someone's making something really complicated, they either are trying to make money off of you and take advantage of you, or they don't know it as well as they think they know it. Because if they can't explain it to someone like a fifth grader, for the most part, they probably don't understand it yeah. super well. But um, yeah, anyway, thanks so much for coming on, man. This is an yeah. awesome conversation. I think people yeah. will really enjoy it. Um, I know we mentioned your accounts a little bit, but if you want to just say where people can find you on social media, and I'll also tag them in the uh, description. Sweet. Yeah. Just at Stealth Health Life. That's it. Tom Walsh. That's that's right. the only social. I'm on TikTok and Instagram. Um, and that's, you know, don't have YouTube or anything yet, but maybe down the line. Instagram and TikTok for now. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good place to be for sure, and we'll uh we'll have those tagged in the description. So yeah, thanks for coming on, Tom. Really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day, man. And uh, yeah. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. It was a great time. All right. All right.